So, uh, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, uh, which is from the Diga Nikaya, so the Buddhist discourses are in um, five major collections, uh, which all of it together we call the suttas. Um, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta appears in two different places. Um, in its full form, it appears in two different places, and then there's several shorter versions which appear elsewhere. So the full-length version appears in the Diga Nikaya and the Majjhima Nikaya, so the long discourses and the medium discourses. And then abbreviated forms appear in several places in the Sangyutta and the Anguttara Nikayas, so the other two major collections. So this also gives you a sense as to how important this discourse was considered uh, in that it appears in every one of the major collections of the Buddha's teachings. So the four main Nikayas, the four major groupings of the Buddha's teachings, every single one of them contains the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, um, either in whole or in separate pieces. Uh, so traditionally, uh, I mentioned earlier, people would memorize and recite the Buddha's teachings. Most people would not memorize all of them though some people would, and even to this day, there are people who memorize the entire um, sutta collection um, and more. Uh, but traditionally, people would focus on memorizing a certain piece of it. Uh, and the, the four main Nikayas was one grouping. It's like people would focus on memorizing just the Majjhima Nikaya, for example, which is not a lot. It's a bit less than a thousand pages. Um, so we only think that's a lot because these days we don't memorize things very much. Um, but it used to be that people would memorize huge amounts of material and it was just considered part of, part of ordinary scholarly life. These days everything is written down so we don't memorize things as much as we used to. Um, so Mahasatipatthana, uh, so Maha means great. Uh, Satipatthana, Sati is mindfulness. Um, I'm actually going to pull up... Uh, a document so I can type these things out more easily. Um, so maha is great, sati is mindfulness, uh, and then we have patana, uh, and there's two different opinions as to what this part of the word means. One is that it means uh, basis or foundation. Uh, the other is that it's an abbreviation of uh, upatana, uh, which means establishing uh, or setting up. Um, and I'm more inclined in the second camp, um, both because that makes a bit more sense as to how the Buddha talks about Satipatthana, but also because throughout the suttas we commonly see the phrase uh, Sating uh, Upat. Oh, my mind is blanking off the top of it. Uh, but we commonly see Sati coupled with the, the verb form of Upatana. Um, so that also gives weight to the idea that, that this is the word the Buddha meant. Um, but actually, both of them communicate a useful meaning. Uh, so the four satipatthanas are the four either bases or foundations of mindfulness, which is one common translation, or they're the four places where we establish mindfulness, the four domains of establishing mindfulness. Um, so uh, the sutta begins, evang me suttang, so thus have I heard. Ekang samayang bhagava karusu viharati kamasa damang nama karunang nigamo. So the on one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was dwelling among the Kurus, so a group of people uh, in a village named Kamasa Dhamma. Uh, this is just setting the place of the sutta. It's not really relevant to the content of the sutta. Um, Tatrako Bhagava Bhikkhu Amantesi, so there the Buddha addressed the monks, Bhikkhavoti monks, Vadanteiti Te Bhikkhu Bhagavato Pachasosung, um, so the uh, Venerable Sir, those monks replied to the Blessed One. Uh, the Blessed One said this, Ekaino yang bhikkave mago satanang vasudhya sokapari devanang samitikamaya dukadomana sanang atangamaya nyayasa adigamaya nibbanasa sachikiriyaya yarirang chattaro satipatthana. So, Ekaino, 
here also there's been some debate about the meaning of, of this phrase. Um, so we have eka, which means one, and ayana, which means, uh, literally it means going uh, or path. Um, and then after that we have maga, which uh, more literally means road or path. Uh, so the uh, ekayana, ekayana maga, uh, the one going path. Um, so one translation of this then is the path which goes in one direction. So it goes in one direction only, which is towards enlightenment. Um, so the four satipatthanas is a path which leads uh, unerringly or directly towards awakening. It leads only in that one direction. Um, some people translate this as the only path, but that's not quite what it says in Pali. That's a bit of a stretch. Um, and also the Buddha talks about many other ways of practicing. Um, so it would seem a bit strange if here he meant the only way. So I think more likely is that, uh, again, it means the, uh, the one-way path, the path which leads only one direction, which is towards full enlightenment. Uh, so ekayano uh, mago, the one-way path, the one-direction path. Um, satanang vasudhya. So vasudhya means for purification, satanang of living beings. Sokapari devanang samite kamaya, so for transcending sorrow and lamentation. Dukkha domina sanang atangamaya, for the disappearance of pain and depression. Uh, nyayasa, for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of knowing. Um, so adigamaya means for attaining. So adigamaya nyayasa is for attaining knowledge. This is the direct knowledge of the true nature of reality. That's what he's talking about here. Nibbana is satchikiriyaya. So uh, satchikiriyaya means for realizing. Satchikiriyaya literally means uh, doing it with your own eyes, like seeing with your own eyes. Uh, of Nibbana, so for realizing Nibbana, for seeing Nibbana with your own eyes. So Nibbana, uh, briefly speaking, Nibbana means uh, enlightenment, awakening. Um, the Buddha describes Nibbana as the complete absence of greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, the irreversible purification of the mind from greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, so this uh, Coupling of direct wisdom with complete purity. Uh, so, Yaridang Chattaro Satipatthana. So, that is the four uh, establishings of mindfulness uh, or the four bases of mindfulness. Any questions so far? Is this too much? Am I going too much into linguistics? No. Okay, no problems. Everyone on board? All right, we'll keep going. Katame Chattaro, what for? Idabhikave bhikkhu kaye kayanu pasivaharati. So here amongst a monk, or by extension, any sincere practitioner. Kaye kayanu pasivaharati. So this also takes a little bit of explanation here. Um, so kaye uh, means body, and it's the locative case. So uh, at the body about the body, in reference to the body, and kayanupasi is two pieces. So kaya, which means body, and anupasi, uh, anupasi, uh, which is made of two parts. Um, anu, anu, which means along uh, or with, and pasi. Uh, which means to see. So anupasi uh, literally means seeing along, uh, or mm, in more normal language we would say perceiving or regarding or uh, paying attention to. So kaye kaye anupasi, uh, seeing the body or perceiving the body um, in the body, in terms of the body, uh, in reference to the body. Uh, so one way I've seen this translated is perceiving the body as the body, 
perceiving, uh, so seeing the body on its own terms, seeing the body as it is. Um, or seeing the body in terms of the body means not, uh, not regarding the body as a concept or as an idea, uh, but rather as a felt experience, as an actual felt bodily thing. So rather than regarding the body as a mental object or an idea, um, rather seeing it as a, a physical experience, so something which, which you experience as a bodily experience instead of as an idea or a concept. Uh, so this is directly relevant to the practice of, of sati, of mindfulness, in that we're not interested in a concept about our body, we're interested in feeling it as it actually is. Um, so atapi means ardent or uh, with perseverance. Sampajano, clearly knowing. Satima means mindful, so it's from the same root, uh, from the same word sati. So satima means possessing mindfulness, mindful. Uh, vinaya loke abhija domina sang. Vinaya means having removed. Uh, loke means in the world or about the world. Abhija domina sang. So abhija is uh, covetousness or craving or obsession. And dominasa is depression or downheartedness. Uh, so one mm, dwells, paying attention to the body as a body uh, on its own terms paying attention to the body as it is, um, ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful, having removed all craving and depression regarding the world. Are we on board? Any questions? Kind of a dead crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, if, it, if my question is if they're looking at the body as the body, is the body the one feeling the craving, or wouldn't the craving be coming from the mind? So with this, what he's talking about here is uh, we're setting aside uh, all of our desires and depression about the world. Okay. Um, we're setting that aside while we're doing a practice of just focusing attention on the body. Uh, okay, that's what he meant. So, right. yeah, so yes, craving is a mental object, okay. and that comes up towards the end of the discourse. Uh, the Buddha talks about looking at the mind and the contents of the mind and the states of mind, but that comes later. Okay. The first establishment of mindfulness is the body. Uh, and there's good reasons for this. Uh, so the body is the, the coarsest and the most obvious, the hardest to argue with. Um, <laughs> it's the hardest to be delusional about. Mm. We're still very delusional about our bodies, yeah. but it's, it's much easier to be delusional about our minds. So we start with our body because it's this big, heavy, meaty chunk right here, and it's really hard to miss. Um, some people still manage to miss it. I don't know how they survive. Um, but some people, they really, they really can't feel their body. They're really not aware of their body. Uh, and that's why it's, it's so critical to start with just getting some awareness of the coarsest, most obvious layer of our experience, which is the body. Uh, and the body also is the most stable part of our experience. The body is not stable, by the way, but it's the most stable. It's the least unstable part of our experience. So that also helps to stabilize the mind. By focusing the mind on the body, the mind starts to become more stable. And as the mind becomes more stable, it's easier to train and it's easier to understand. Anything else before I move on? Okay, Vedana uh, Suvedana Nupasi Viharati, Atapi Sampajano Satima, Vinaya Loke Bija Domana Sang. So now it's paying attention to feelings. Uh, so Vedana, uh, commonly translated as feeling, uh, sometimes as sensing or experiencing. Um, refers specifically to the experience of Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Um, so it's not feeling in the sense of emotion, uh, and it's not sensing in terms of forming 
uh, ideas or concepts about sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, and so on. It's just that direct experience. So like when I touch this laptop, for me, that's a pleasant sensation. Uh, when I smell cilantro, that's an unpleasant sensation. Uh, the feeling of the air is a neutral sensation. So it's that direct qualitative reaction that we have to our sensations. Uh, so before I even have a concept of computer, there's a pleasantness that happens when my hand touches the keyboard. Before I even have a concept of air, there's a neutral reaction to the sensation of the air. Do you understand? This is what we mean by Vedana uh, in Pali, which is usually translated as feeling. You have a question? I did. Um, is the root word uh, like the Veda? Yeah. Yeah, so the root for this word is uh, vid, oops, vid, which means uh, to know. Uh, it's the base from which we get words, uh, where we get the word Veda, which means body of knowledge. Um, it's also where we get the word Vidya and the Pali form Vidya, which also means knowledge. Uh, and also many other words uh, have this root of of vid, which means to know. Any other questions? Okay. Chitte chittanu pasi vaharati atapi sampajano satima venir loke bija domana sang. Chitta is the mind. Uh, and in Buddhism, we don't make any distinction between mind and heart. Uh, so that distinction comes up in Western philosophy, but it's not present in Buddhist philosophy. In Buddhist philosophy, citta means the whole mental domain, which includes emotions and perceptions and ideas and thoughts and uh, all of those things. It's like all the, the whole domain of, of mental activity and emotional activity is all included within mind, within citta. Uh, then, dhamme su dhammanu pasivaharati atapi sampajano satima vene loke bija domana sang. So this fourth satipatthana uh, is dhammas, uh, and this also requires some explanation. So the word dhamma, most commonly in a Buddhist context, we use that to mean um, the Buddha's teachings. And that's very common, perfectly valid use of it. Uh, another way it's commonly used is just generally speaking objects, things, uh, or phenomena, uh, which can be either physical or mental. Uh, sometimes it's used specifically to mean mental objects. Uh, sometimes it's used to mean reality uh, as it is, uh, or truth as it is. Um, there's a few other uses that it has, but these are the, the main ones which are most directly relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, so in the context of the four Satipatthana, uh, Dhamma is often translated as uh, mind objects or qualities of mind, mental characteristics, um, as opposed to citta, which is the, the mind itself, the feeling of the mind itself. But uh, as you'll see when we get to the sections on citta and dhamma, that's not a sufficient explanation. It's not complete. It doesn't really give the whole picture. Uh, so I'm going to leave off explaining exactly how the word dhamma is used here and, until we get to that section, because then it will be much more clear. Uh, but broadly speaking, here we see the four categories, so kaya, body, uh, vedana, feeling, citta, mind, and dhamma, uh, phenomena. Okay? So the four areas of our experience uh, that we're examining. So I'll just line them all up here to be clear. So then it starts with the first one, uh, so regarding the body. And uh, just to give you a, a bit of a heads up here, for the body, the Buddha gives several different methods 
And each one of them, he starts off by giving a description of the method of developing mindfulness of the body. Um, and for many of them, he gives some kind of simile or some further explanation. Uh, and then a, he ends with uh, a standard phrase where he describes ways of contemplating the nature of our experience. Uh, so using, once there's mindfulness of the body, for example, then using these contemplation exercises to develop insight, uh, to de develop a, a direct understanding of the nature of the body beyond the superficial, ordinary understanding that we have. Uh, so I'll explain that when we get to it. Uh, but just to start with the first method that he gives, uh, the Buddha says, Katanchapana bhikkhuve bhikkhu kaye kayano pasivaharati. He says, how could a monk dwell uh, perceiving the body as it is? Itabhikkhuve bhikkhu aranya gatova, rukamulu gatova, sunyagara gatova. So here a monk um, who's gone to the wilderness uh, or to the foot of a tree or to an empty building. So these are general descriptions of peaceful places, places which are relatively peaceful where you might go to do meditation practice. Nisidati um, palankang, sits down cross-legged. So we actually do like to sit cross-legged when doing meditation and the Buddha recommends sitting cross-legged. So it's it's not something that we do in order to torture ourselves. It's actually something which has a long-standing tradition uh, of being a supportive posture for meditation practice. Nisidati pa lankang abhujitra, ujung hayang panidaya, so making the body upright. Parimukhang setting upatipetra. So there's a lot of debate around this word parimukha. Uh, so parimukha can mean um, to the front. Uh, so one, and here by the way, setting upatipetra, this is what I was saying earlier, as support for the idea that in satipatthana it's sati plus upatthana with the u being elided. Uh, because here we see setting upatipetra, uh, we see this verb upatapetra, which is from the same root as upatana, uh, used together with sati. So satting upatapetra. Um, so parimukhan can mean to the forefront. So having established mindfulness as foremost, as most important. Um, where there's some debate is that parimukha could also mean around the mouth. So some people translate this phrase as establishing mindfulness around your mouth. Um, which makes sense in the context of breath meditation, which is what we see here. But the Buddha uses exactly the same phrase, parimukhang setting upatipetra, when talking about many other meditation methods which don't have anything whatsoever to do with breathing or with your mouth or your nose or anything even remotely related to your mouth or nose. Um, so I find it quite doubtful that parimukha here actually means at the mouth, I think more likely is, as it's said here, it means um, in front of or at the, uh, the front of one's experience. Uh, setting it up is the most important thing. So satova asasati, satova pasasati. So one uh, breathes in mindfully, one breathes out mindfully. Digang va asasanto, digang asasamiti pajanati. Digang va pasasanto, digang pasasamiti pajanati. So when breathing in a long breath, one knows that one's breathing in a long breath. When breathing out a long breath, one knows that one's breathing out a long breath. Same one here, uh, rasang means short. So breathing in a short breath or a quick breath, you know it's a quick breath. Sabakaya um, patisang vedi. Asasisamiti sikkati. Uh, so this means one trains oneself. I will breathe in, experiencing the whole body. Sabakaya pati sangvedi pasasisamiti sikkati. One trains oneself. I will breathe out, experiencing the whole body. Um, here again, there is some debate. Uh, so sabba means whole or entire. Kaya body. Patisangvedi, which is, for those who are interested, from the same root as Vedana, meaning to experience. 
Um, so Sabakaya Patisangvedi, it literally just means experiencing the whole body, uh, which is my interpretation of what the Buddha means here. So this practice here is, as you're paying attention to your breathing, try to feel your whole body from head to toe. Uh, so not just focusing on a certain place in your body, but being aware of the whole body as you're breathing. Uh, some people interpret this to mean the whole breath. Um, but I find that a little bit doubtful because if that's what the Buddha meant, he would have just said your whole breath. Um, instead, he said your whole body. And especially in the context of practicing mindfulness of the body, um, it seems particularly likely that that's what, what he meant by this. So experiencing the whole body, I will breathe in. Experiencing the whole body, I will breathe out. Pasambayangkaya sankarang asasisamiti sikkati. So one trains oneself, I will breathe in uh, calming the bodily formation, so calming uh, physical activities, uh, so bringing the, the body to complete stillness uh, as one breathes. Any questions so far? Are we all on board? So this is a very abbreviated form of instructions on mindfulness of breathing. Uh, what you'll see in many suttas is the Buddha gives a 16-step explanation of how to practice mindfulness of breathing. This is only the first four of the 16 steps. Uh, and this is probably because the first four are what's most directly related to the development of mindfulness. The subsequent 12 steps are about developing first deep samadhi and then cultivating insight into the nature of one's experience, using the breath as a platform for the development of insight. Uh, so in the context of this sutta, that's not really relevant because the Buddha is first focusing on developing mindfulness of the body and then uh, he gives an explanation, which we'll get to in just a moment, of how to use mindfulness of the body as a basis for developing insight. So it's not necessary for him to go into the other steps of mindfulness of breathing here. So then the Buddha gives a simile. Uh, so just as a, a woodcarver or woodcarver's apprentice, uh, so when making a long cut uh, knows I am making a long cut, or when making a short cut knows I am making a short cut. Uh, in the same way, uh, a monk, when breathing in long, knows I am breathing in long. When breathing out low, knows I am breathing out long. So breathing in and out short, one knows, breathing in and out short, and training oneself, I will experience the whole body, and training oneself, I will calm uh, bodily activities. Uh, I will calm the physical uh, activity. Um, so that's the simile the Buddha gives. Uh, and then here he gives this description of practice. Uh, and I find this quite profound, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, so, iti aja tangva kaye kayanupasiva harati. So, thus one dwells uh, perceiving the body as it is internally, ajatang internally. Behidava kaye kayanupasiva harati. One dwells perceiving the body as it is externally. Uh, so, one interpretation is internally means the internal experience of the body, and externally means the outer part of the body. So normally we're mostly aware of the outer part of the body, like our skin, uh, and how we interact with the world through our skin. Normally that's how we relate most strongly to our bodies. And this is a very strange thing when you think about it. Most often we're only really aware of the outer shell of our body, and we just have this kind of like vague conceptual void inside the body. Like we mostly just don't even think that there's anything inside our body, except when something's going wrong in there. Like if you have severe nausea, then you suddenly realize that there's a stomach inside your body. Um, or when you ate too much pasta at lunchtime, then you're like, oh, yep, there's a stomach in there. Um, but much of the time we're kind of oblivious to the inward experience of the body. We're mostly just interested in, in how we relate to the body with the external part of the body. Sorry, how we relate to the world through the external part of the body. So the Buddha is emphasizing here, paying attention to 
the internal experience of the body as well as the outer layer. Uh, and this can be incredibly fascinating. Uh, as your mindfulness practice develops, as your meditation practice gets sharper and clearer, you start to feel every single part of the body inside and out. So you can actually feel your liver. Isn't that weird? You can feel the bones in your thighs. Isn't that interesting? You can feel every single part of your body inside and out. Just most of the time we don't pay much attention because it's not relevant to us unless something's going wrong. We're not really interested in what's going on inside the body. Um, yeah. So is he, um, uh, the Buddha, is he given, like, in this foundation of mindfulness, is he given different ways you can be, like, I, I guess just different ways you can be mindful in this, this part? Like, is he, um, I'm, not, I'm not really saying it right. Because he's, he's saying that you can be, uh, you, if you breathe in, you breathe out, your mind, you can be mindful in this way. You can take a short breath in, you can take a short breath in, you can be mindful in that way. And he's given, so I guess he's given different ways, that, uh, that different states of mindfulness within the body that you can have. Like, is that, is that it? I don't understand. Okay, I, I, it's all jumbled up, but what, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, is it, to, to me, I don't know, to me it looks like he just, it, it's different ways that you can be mindful in the body. Is that's that's what he's stating? Like you can have uh, different mm. ways you can see things. Like, and, like say if you're meditating, um, you, maybe one day you might be having a long breath. Like your your breathing might be longer. Well, another day you might have a short breath. Mm. Oh, another day. Um, uh, I guess I don't, I don't know what else you said that that does some of the other qualifications for uh, this foundation. But there's different ways you can be mindful and still be mindful of the body. Is that? Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, as we go through this section, you'll see the Buddha gave several different methods for developing mindfulness of the body. Um, but all of them wind up with the same thing, which is having this direct felt experience of the body. This non-conceptual direct experience of the body. And the different methods are just ways of starting to train ourselves to pay close attention to the body. So, like the thing about long breath and short breath, um, my understanding is that the Buddha is just giving those as examples. Sometimes you'll have long, slow breathing and sometimes you'll have short, fast breathing. But whichever one it is, be clearly aware of it. Be clearly aware of the experience. So you don't need to make your breath long or slow or fast or shallow or any of that. Whatever it is, is fine, as long as you're clearly aware of it. Because that's one way that we start to bring attention to the body. We start to focus the mind on being clearly aware of the body. Does that make sense? Ajata Bihidava Kaye Kaino Pasivaharati. So one dwells aware both internally and externally. So aware of the body both internally and externally at the same time. Um, and here's where we get into really fun things. Samudaya Dhammanu Pasiva Kayas Mingvaharati. So one dwells perceiving the arising of phenomena in the body uh, or the, the nature of arising. So samudaya dhamma. Uh, so we mentioned earlier dhamma having these, these meanings as I mentioned. Um, but when dhamma is used as a suffix, uh, it has the meaning of uh, characteristic quality or nature. Uh, so samudaya means arising and let's see what's the other word he uses um, and vaya dhammanu pasiva kaya smingraharati vaya means vanishing or disappearing so samudaya dhamma means the characteristic quality of arising uh, vaya dhamma means the characteristic or quality of vanishing. Okay. So what he's saying here then, uh, so samudaya dhammanu pasi, uh, one dwells seeing the characteristic of arising in the body. So noticing how bodily sensations appear in each moment. So every moment new body sensations are appearing. 
manifesting, coming into being. Vaya um, So regarding the characteristic of vanishing in the body. So noticing how every moment body sensations are disappearing. Okay? So every moment, every sensation in your body disappears. In every moment, a set of body sensations appears. Do you understand? Um, and then here's where things get really trippy. Samudaya vaya dhammanu pasivakaya svingraharati. So one dwells perceiving arising and vanishing in the body. Uh, so at the same time, seeing arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing, happening simultaneously in the body. Uh, so again, this is meant to be a practice that you train yourself to pay attention to the constant appearing and disappearing of bodily sensations. And if you do this practice with sincerity, then your experience of your body will completely transform. Uh, you will no longer perceive your body as a stable, persistent object, because it isn't. Instead, you will perceive your body as a insubstantial process of continually appearing and vanishing sensations. And as you pay close attention to the simultaneous appearing and vanishing of sensations, then even when the sensations are present, they seem to be not quite real. They seem to be insubstantial, hollow, void, empty. So this is an incredibly potent meditation method that he's describing here. Uh, so first, developing mindfulness of the body. So developing a sharp, clear, direct knowing of the body. Sharp, clear, direct awareness of your body. And then observing the continuous arising and ceasing of bodily sensation, and then observing the simultaneous arising and ceasing of body sensation. Uh, so in doing this then, one comes to see that this belief that we've always had, that our body is a stable, persistent, solid object, is utter fantasy, with no relation whatsoever to what we actually experience. And the only way we've been able to keep up this fantasy is by not paying enough attention by not paying close attention to our own body. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, should we try to pay attention to, um, so should we try to tune in to the actual rising and ceasing? Um, or should it just happen naturally, where it's like, um, once you actually notice the sensation, um, it's sort of like you realize that there is um, some kind of Generally speaking, you have to make an effort uh, because our habit of perceiving the world as composed of solid, persistent objects, that habit is extremely strong. So we will just keep habitually perceiving the world in that way, even though we know it's wrong. We just keep doing it because that's what we're used to doing. So you have to actually consciously train your mind to pay attention to arising and vanishing. If you don't consciously train your mind to see the world in that way, then it won't. It will just keep seeing the world as composed of solid, persistent objects. So even though intellectually we know that's not right, that's our experience because that's our habit. So in theory, if you can drop all pre-existing concepts and habits and just see what's going on, then you'll naturally see everything as arising and ceasing you'll naturally see the impermanent, insubstantial, empty nature of reality. That was the case with the Buddha. Uh, nobody told the Buddha that this was the way reality was. Um, but the Buddha was completely open-minded to seeing reality on its own terms, and he was willing to drop all of his preconceived ideas and habits about the world uh, and see, see the world as it really is. So he could see this, uh, and then he described it to us um, so that uh, we have a pointer which we can use as a guide for helping us develop our mind in this way. So you can try, you can try just sitting with reality as it is and see if you can just naturally drop your old habits and 
see arising and vanishing. Um, and for some people that's enough. Uh, but many people they find that it's necessary uh, to consciously bring up the perception of impermanence. Consciously pay attention to arising and ceasing. At least in the beginning. Uh, it's uh, easier to do it as an intentional practice. And after a while it can become a bit more automatic. Uh, but in the beginning, it doesn't happen naturally uh, because our habit is, is the opposite. Does that make sense? Any uh, Yes, Cam. Um, it, it makes sense when it comes to sensations mm. in ceasing and rising. But what happens with observing the impermanence of the conventionally present body parts? For example, I have a nose. And nose exists, and my arms exist. But if we don't talk about sensations arising and ceasing of my arms or my nose, how do I then understand impermanence of my nose or my arms when it's not about sensation but the bodily part? So nose is just an idea that you have. There's no yeah. such... <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, 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 what's there is a set of constantly changing sensations. You call it a nose, but what you call a nose is different in every moment. So nose only exists as an idea. It doesn't exist as an actual experience. When I twist it, it hurts. And the sensation I know it comes and you go. So what you're saying is that when you touch this collection of constantly arising and ceasing sensations, then a set of sensations arise and cease. That's what you just said. There's not a nose anywhere in there. It's just a bunch of sensations arising and ceasing. You put the label nose on that, but that's just your own ideas. Isn't that the perception of the body, it's emptiness and there's no body sitting here. But conventionally there's a body sitting here. There's an idea. You have an idea that there's a body sitting there. I'll agree with you on that. So would you say the same thing about like a car or a chair? These are all just ideas. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, what we have is simply a, a, a set of constantly changing sensations. Actually, we don't even have a set of constantly changing sensations. What we have is in every moment, a set of sensations appears and disappears. And the next moment, a different set of sensations appears and disappears. That's what we have. Um, and then we create ideas of distinct persistent objects and we project those ideas onto our uh, experience. So you don't actually experience a nose or an arm or a car. What you experience is each moment, the momentary arising and vanishing of a set of sensations. That's what you experience. So you'll be experiencing danger. What's that? You certainly experience the concept of danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reality of danger. Is there something, like if, if the mind is considered a sixth sense, is there something comparable to, to this instruction in the mind mm -hmm. thing? So, mm -hmm. so you have, if I'm also, I guess I'm just kind of curious, I mean, the root that we're talking about here, it, I assume is related to Vedana, the second, like when we're talking about sensation here. So, the second foundation is it, you're really dealing with the quality, I guess, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Mm -hmm. And here you're focused on the arising and the dissipation. And I guess, you know, what I was just assuming what I just said is accurate. I was just curious with, cause if we're focusing on bodily, which makes sense because we're in the body, the bodily sensations, if there was something, you know, comparable in the mind section that would be like the yes. mind. Yes, yeah, so this, this set of instructions appears under every single meditation method the Buddha describes for all four satipatthanas. So for every one of them, he gives this same set of instructions. So to perceive it internally and externally, and to perceive the um, appearing and vanishing. So it appears in every section. So also with Vedana, and also with the mind, and also with phenomena, with every single one of them, to be aware of it arising and vanishing. You had a question? Yeah, you, you, you mentioned uh, if you're focusing on the body, you can feel the liver mm -hmm. and the bones. Mm -hmm. 
how do you get there? I mean, you know, I understand this conceptually you can, but what are the steps to actually free the EP? Why do you think you need steps? The sensations are right there, we just normally ignore them. So the willingness to feel and directing your mind towards feeling those parts is actually enough. Um, the problem is that we have this very strong block. Uh, not everyone, but most people have a very strong block towards feeling the inside of their body. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, but actually, like in uh, modern psychology, they say that we black out 99% of our experience moment by moment. 99% we completely ignore. We're not consciously aware of 99% of what we perceive. Um, so most of that, uh, so most of the inside of your body fits in that 99%. We just black it out. Uh, so that's part of what makes Buddhist practice so difficult, is that we have this incredibly deeply rooted habit of blacking out most of what we experience. So there's things... It's really that we're just not... Most of us just don't, are not paying enough attention. We're exactly. Attention. Yeah, we're just not paying enough attention to our body. So as you practice mindfulness of the body, then your awareness of the body becomes sharper and clearer and more complete. And you can start to feel the inside of your body if you want to. Uh, it's right here. It's never been anywhere else. It's always been right here. It's like right now, I can, I'm directing attention to the inside of my body, and it's here. It's always been here. We're just not used to, to directing our attention in that way. So in the beginning, it's, it seems a bit, a bit strange, kind of like a two-dimensional object trying to go in, in the third dimension. It's kind of like, how do you do that? Um, but then you start doing it, and you're like, oh, of course, it's right here. Um, so often it's easier to start with paying attention to the outside layer of your body because that's more accessible. And then slowly letting your attention seep inwards. Often that's easier. Um, also, uh, another thing which can be helpful is with mindfulness of breathing. Because with mindfulness of breathing, you feel your lungs, which are inside your body. So you start to get some awareness of what it feels like to be aware of the inside of your body, at least in the torso region. Is that like, are you going to be mindful of that all the time when you're just like going to the grocery store or whatever, or is it just... Oh, if you want to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like... Uh, it's not a problem. That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a problem in your mind. I'm not saying uh, it's so problem, mindfulness. I'm just wondering if it's possible to like yes, do other things and be mindful of all that stuff try. at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. So being more mindful makes you more functional, not less functional. <laughs> Lack of mindfulness is what causes problems in our lives. More mindfulness is not a bad thing. It's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Why do you want to be like mindful of the whole? I feel like I see Chitta, do you want to answer this one? <laughs> why do we why should we be mindful of our body? When you awareness of all the things that you are doing like this moment, you can you can have a wisdom inside you. So you can see very clearly all the things and you can you just reduce all the suffering. Because of the directly you can see the very clear things, all the things around you. So living as a very pure person, so do not have any uh, uh, stress from the anything at all, if you are fully mindful. Mm -hmm. So don't make any mistake, very, very little, if you are fully mindful. 
All the things are very grateful to enjoy your life. That's why we practice with the Buddhist, the Buddha's uh, teaching to make us calm and happy, peaceful, and all the things are very wisely. I feel like, so what to walk in meditation, um, I feel like I don't know where to put my attention on, like on the feet or? Oh, just when you like walk. If I put my um, attention on the feet, then what would the wise thing come about? Is you don't have to think about the wise at the moment. What, that, what, what fits you doing this moment, just attention to the walking. When you're walking, just attention to the one foot by foot very carefully. So if you do that, if there is dangerous, you can see directly, so you just quickly can uh, avoid. Everything like that. When you're uh, work, working at the kitchen, you you not attend, attend uh, not focus on the what you're doing. You're just doing whatever you do randomly. Sometimes you have a shift in order, uh, you, you have a problem. But you are uh, awareness of what you're doing. All the things are very quickly can do and the very perfectly. Also, the energy is uh, the all in there. The food is so delicious and <laughs> gonna be a medicine for you. Really. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and anything else before I go on? What's that? Yes, please do. Um, as long as it doesn't blur out the screen. Um, is that OK for everyone? Yeah, no problem? OK. So then the Buddha goes on, Atikayoti vapanasa sati patita hoti yavadevanyana mataya patis sati mataya. Where he says, or mindfulness is established uh, enough for there to be awareness and knowing there is the body. So this is, this is very simple. So he's giving these contemplation practices. Uh, so he's saying being aware of the body internally and externally, being aware of the appearing and vanishing. So it's very uh, deep, profound method. But then he says, or you can just be aware that there's the body. <laughs> um, so I find this really delicious. The Buddha is also keeping it real here. He's just like, directly see the insubstantial nature of all things. Or you could just be aware that there's a body here. Um, so he's kind of like, here's the PhD level material, but if that's too much for you, just pay attention to your body. Um, so uh, I actually find this really helpful. Uh, are you aware of your body in any way? Are you at least vaguely aware that your body is here? Then you're practicing mindfulness of the body not to the highest extent, um, not to the deepest, most profound level, but you're still practicing this foundation of mindfulness to some degree. Uh, and that's pretty good. Keep it up. Keep deepening that gradually, bit by bit, making your awareness of the body sharper and more complete and more precise. Uh, and in time, you can do the more uh, profound contemplation exercises. So I really like that the Buddha does give this here. He's like, or you can just be aware that there's the body. Um, then the Buddha makes this beautifully profound statement. So I'm going to pull this into the other document so we can look at it more closely. Anisito chavaharati nachikinchi loke yopadiyati. So anisito uh, means not dependent, uh, literally not leaning on. Uh, Chevaharati. So one lives independent, not depending on anything, not relying on anything. Nachikinchi loke upadiyati. And one does not cling to anything in the world. Uh, so upadiyati, um, for those who are familiar with some Buddhist technical terms, um, is the verb form of upadana. So upadiyati means to be clung to. So nothing whatsoever in the world is to be clung to. Nothing whatsoever to the world is clung to. So one dwells independent um, and nothing in the world is clung to. So one has no attachment or grasping for anything in the world. So this is the state of mind that we're trying to develop and maintain while practicing uh, the satipatthanas. So the mind which doesn't rely upon anything, which doesn't need anything, 
and which isn't grasping at or trying to hold on to anything in the world. He says, in this way, uh, a monk dwells uh, perceiving the body as it is, perceiving the body as the body. So that's the first section for mindfulness of the body, the first method, so mindfulness of breathing uh, and the contemplation exercises that one can do once one has some awareness of the body. Um, any questions before I move on to the next section? Yes. I have a question about the word because it has dana in it. Is that like not giving? Um, close. So it comes from three parts. Upa, which means close. Ah, which can mean towards, against, or in reverse. And dana, which does mean giving. Um, so adana means taking, so the reverse of giving is taking. So upadana means taking close. So upadana, usually it's translated as grasping, clinging, or attachment. Literally it means taking close. Okay, anything else? All right, so the next section here, uh, this one's a bit shorter. Puna chaparang bhikkhave bhikkhu gachanto vagachamiti pajanati. He says, here's another one, monks. Uh, while moving, a monk knows I am moving. Titova titom hiti pajanati. While standing, he knows I am standing. Nisinova nisinom hiti pajanati. While sitting, he knows I am sitting. Sayanova sayanom hiti pajanati. While reclining, Knows I'm reclining. Yata yatava panasakayo panahito hoti, tata tata nang pajanati. Or in whatever position the body is in, one knows that. Um, and then he makes the same, repeat, uh, uh, repeats the same statement. Thus one dwells perceiving the body as the body internally, externally, both internally and externally, perceiving the nature of arising, the nature of vanishing, the nature of both arising and vanishing or one is aware of the existence of the body, um, and one dwells independent and does not cling to anything in the world. Uh, so in this way, a, a monk is perceiving the body as the body. So this is the practice of always being aware of what posture your body is in. So when you're sitting, be aware that you're sitting. When you're standing, be aware that you're standing. When you're walking, be aware that you're walking, uh, and so on. And this seems like a very simple thing, but pay attention as you go throughout the day. Pay attention in particular to when you transition between postures. Try that. So from now until the next class, pay attention to when you switch postures. And what you'll notice is that at some point it will just suddenly hit you. Oh, I'm walking, but I don't remember when I transitioned from standing to walking. Or you'll be like, oh, I'm sitting, but I don't remember transitioning from standing to sitting. Uh, so this practice of always being aware of what posture you're in, and in particular being aware when you transition between postures, will start to bring a lot more awareness of, the, of your body into your everyday life. So this is another important element here, which uh, although this sutta is commonly spoken about as being a sutta about meditation, the Buddha is actually talking about every single waking moment. So not just when we're sitting in meditation, but also when we're walking around or standing or lying down. Um, and again, when switching between postures, uh, this is where things get particularly interesting. Because so often we just blank out the transition times. Uh, and often we don't even catch on to our new posture until we've already been in it for several seconds or even several minutes. Um, so there's nothing else on this one. Uh, any questions or comments before I move on? Awareness of body posture. I do work a lot with the attention and every single moment of mindfulness of the body. 
However, the purpose I do is totally different. <laughs> so just to make sure the purpose here is to kind of uh, not attach, not identify in, in anything. Mm -hmm. Just like to be constantly present to in any process, any on a micro level, on a macro level. Well, he my body and yeah, so he, uh, uh, as you're saying, um, it's not just about being aware of your body just for the fun of it or in order to be a better dancer or something, mm -hmm. though that's, that's a side effect. Um, but rather it's once you're fully clearly aware of your body, then to perceive the constant arising and disappearing, the constant manifesting and vanishing of the bodily experience. Um, so that we can let go of our attachment to the body. We can let go of our cycles of desire and aversion related to the body. Uh, because that's what's making us so uncomfortable all the time. That's what's making us unhappy and confused. Is this constantly trying to attach to something which we can't attach to. It's actually impossible to cling to the body uh, because the body is insubstantial. It's just arising and vanishing, arising and vanishing. Uh, simultaneously, all the time. There's nothing there you can hold on to. It's like trying to grab a fistful of water or a fistful of air. You just can't do it. There's nothing to grab. Uh, but we keep trying, which makes us really uncomfortable all the time. So first being clearly mindfully aware of the body, well, that's just the first step. Mindfulness alone doesn't lead to enlightenment. It just leads to mindfulness. Uh, you can mindfully do all kinds of horrible things and not be one step closer to enlightenment. Um, so instead, we, we cultivate mindfulness as a basis for developing insight, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is something which, for most of us, that's something we have to intentionally do. Intentionally pay attention to the simultaneous arising and ceasing of the body and intentionally make an effort to let go of our desire and attachment in relationship to the body. And then notice how much happier you become when you're not attaching to anything, when you're not dependent upon anything. On a practical uh, question, while I'm meditating, so while I'm doing the um, sitting um, still meditation, the point is to, uh, on this practice, uh, so, to kind of be completely open and aware in the present moment of any sensation that arise a, and vanish, as you said. But sometimes I, I can actually stay with one single sensation for 40 mm. minutes. So is it the opposite, what you are actually talking mm. about? To kind of not, to not to attach to one single thing, but to kind of... It's just like, it, I, I don't know where I am at <laughs> in my process because for me, if you tell me, oh, focus on your hand, okay, I do it for hours. Oh, good, no great, great. But then I'm like, uh, but then I'm not aware of the phenomenon of disappearing. <laughs> then of that's the what you need to work on. <laughs> I'm too much on my hand. Then. So it sounds like you already have pretty good mindfulness and concentration, so sati and samadhi. Mm -hmm. uh, so then what you need to work on is developing insight. So work on developing the perception of impermanence directly feeling the insubstantial, impermanent, empty, hollow, constantly appearing and vanishing nature of the body. Uh, so when you develop this perception, then it's almost like your body disappears. You're still fully aware of it, but you're fully aware that it's not real. Well, my Zen teacher, Revan Myo, would say it's, it's kind of real partially real. It's kind of half real. Uh, but you'll feel that for yourself. So yeah, it's great that you can uh, define a region of mindfulness for yourself and stay within that region. Mm -hmm. That's not attachment. Uh, that's object-based meditation, which is most forms of meditation. That's good. Uh, that's not attachment in the ordinary sense of attachment leading to, to mm -hmm. dukkha, leading to suffering. Uh, rather, that's training the mind to stay within boundaries, which is very important because if we can't get our mind to hold within certain boundaries, then we can't develop wisdom. Uh, so you first need to train the mind to hold still within specific boundaries. 
So the size of those boundaries doesn't matter that much. Whether it's your whole body or one tiny part of your body, doesn't matter. What matters is that you give boundaries for your mind and you keep it within those boundaries. Um, then you'll start to develop stillness of mind. And within those boundaries, you cultivate a sharp, clear awareness of whatever is present. Uh, so that's developing uh, mindfulness, so, sh so clear knowing, direct knowing within that domain. Um, and once you have that, so both stillness and direct awareness, then you introduce the perception of impermanence, which is the practice the Buddha is talking about here. Uh, and then your experience of the body will change dramatically and shockingly. Mm. I guess what happened to me is that I embody, I, I embody things a lot. So I don't know if this is the right path or not. No, it's perfect because okay. <laughs> um, it sounds like you have a lot of attachment to body experience. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a method which is directly aimed at breaking that attachment. Yeah, I do love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. Okay, anything else before I move on? Okay. Puna chaprang bhikkhave bhikkhu abhikante patikante sampajanakari hoti. So here's another one, monks. Uh, a monk is clearly aware while uh, advancing and retreating, so while moving forward and moving backward. Alokite vilokite sampajana kari hoti. So clearly aware while looking around. Saminjite uh, pasarite sampajana kari hoti. So clearly aware while um, extending and contracting one's limbs. Sangati patachivra dharane sampajana kari hoti. So clearly aware while wearing one's robes and carrying one's bowl and one's cloak. This is a specific reference to monastics, but for everybody else, while wearing your clothes and carrying your stuff. Um, for us, our stuff is our bowl and our cloak. Asite, pite, kayate, saite, sampajana, kari, hoti. So clearly aware while eating, drinking, tasting, and swallowing. Uchara, pasava, kame, sampajana, kari, hoti. Clearly aware while urinating and defecating. Um, this is an interesting one because so many of us are disgusted by the process of urinating and defecating that we try to just pretend it never happens. Um, kind of like in movies, like the, the character goes into the bathroom and then it cuts and then it comes back and the person's coming out of the bathroom. But it doesn't actually show what happens during that time. For many people, this is how their life is. Like we go in the bathroom and it's like cut scene, commercial break, and then you come out of, uh, a minute later and it's like nothing happened. Nope. So to be clearly intensely, precisely aware throughout even the experiences that we normally consider disgusting or unpleasant or uninteresting. So clearly aware while moving, standing, sitting, reclining, um, while awake, um, uh, while waking up. So sutte while falling asleep, jagarite while waking up. Um, these are interesting practices as well. Um, so one practice which is sometimes recommended is try to be aware of the moment that you fall asleep. Not easy. Not easy. Hello, hello, please come in. Yeah. Um, you missed all the fun parts. Yeah. Actually, that's harsh. There's one teacher I know who, whenever someone comes in late, they say like, oh, you're just on time. We're just <laughs> getting to the interesting part. So you're just on time. We're just, just getting to the interesting part. So sutte, so to be clearly aware while falling asleep. Uh, jagarate, to be clearly aware while waking up. So also the practice of trying to be clearly aware of your first waking moment when you wake up. Basite, uh, while uh, speaking, so to be clearly aware while speaking. Um, this one is exceptionally difficult, by the way. Uh, most of us, while we're engaging in conversation, um, we're so wrapped up in the exchange of words and ideas that we completely lose awareness of our body. Or our awareness of our body becomes very vague and unclear. So here the Buddha is recommending, while speaking, 
try to remain clearly aware of your body. Um, so one way you can do this is by paying attention to your lips uh, and your tongue while you speak. Absolutely fascinating. It's just mind-blowing what your lips and your tongue do while you speak. This also goes when eating, by the way. When eating, pay attention to your tongue. Your tongue is doing the most insane acrobatics while you're eating. And most of it is happening subconsciously. Like we don't really think, okay, now I'm going to push the food 12 degrees to the upper left. We just do it. Uh, and, and we twist and contort the tongue in all kinds of crazy ways while we're eating. So being clearly aware uh, of your lips and your tongue uh, while speaking and while eating can bring a lot more body awareness into those conditions where we tend to get lost very easily. Uh, Tony Bhaves, uh, this is while silent. So to be clearly aware while silent. Um, so the context here, so while speaking and while silent, um, this might be referring to conversation. So while we're speaking and then also while we're silently listening to the other person or more likely while we're silently waiting for our turn to start talking again. Uh, so to be clearly aware of your body. Uh, so not planning what you're going to say next or not railing silently about how much you hate what the person is saying or whatever, but just being clearly aware of your body uh, as you uh, are silent. And he makes the, the same mm, contemplation exercise. So thus one knows the body internally and externally. One knows its nature of arising and vanishing. Uh, one is clearly aware of the existence of the body, uh, and one dwells independent, uh, so not clinging to anything in the world. Okay, anything on this one? Questions or comments? One thing I, I've been aware of for some reason lately is um, the way my eyelids move and my eyes move, and I'm kind of fascinated with that, and sometimes mm. I just aware of that, but I mean, I guess we haven't really talked about that specifically, but you're talking about the tongue and everything. It's just like, mm. there's so much going on there. Yeah, I think, um, focus on. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, thank you for bringing that up because, yeah, that's another area so, yeah, uh, that we can bring attention to. It, but it's, for me, it's really easy to focus on that, I don't know, lately, like it just started Yeah, what can be really helpful is to try to get some sense of where in the body you have a, uh, the, the most blind spot, like where in your body you're normally not very aware of, right. and then try to practice being aware of that part of your body. So we usually have certain areas of the body that we're more aware of and others that we're less aware of. So try to figure out what parts of your body you're, you're less aware of and actively practice paying attention to it. So you might have that, like, today I'm going to be clearly aware of my lower back. Uh, or today I'm going to be clearly aware of my left shoulder. Uh, if those are areas that you're normally not very aware of. And, and take it on as a practice and see how it changes things. Um, so one, one very common meditation method that you'll encounter is the practice of, of scanning the body. Uh, of slowly moving your attention through the body piece by piece. And what people commonly experience when they do this meditation is that some parts of the body, it's extremely easy and they have a very clear, powerful, detailed awareness. And then other areas of the body, it's just like a dense black fog where like they're barely even aware that the body exists in that location. Uh, so try to find the areas where you're you're more hazy, and actively cultivate sharp, clear awareness in those areas. Okay? Um, but it's also important to do things that are interesting, because when we're interested in the practice, then we'll do it. When we're not interested, it's going to be much harder. 
Um, so yeah, things like your eyelids. Fascinating, I agree. Lots of fun. Um, so whatever keeps you interested in the practice, uh, it's worth exploring. Yeah, my point was, I guess, that I, it's not something that I ever no really noticed so much before, but just for some reason lately I've been, like, I, I've been kind of focusing on that, and it kind of makes me, and I think, understand what you're talking about, about isolating different bodily functions and mm -hmm. focusing on them. Yeah. Um, anything else on this section before I move on? Okay. Um, now we're getting into more fun stuff. Well, it's all fun in its own ways. Puna chaprang bhikkhave bhikkhu imame vakayang udang padatala adoke simatika tachapar yantang purang nan apakaras asuchino pachave kati. He says, monks, here's another one. Um, a monk uh, pays attention to. Uh, this body up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head um, all wrapped in skin so tacha means skin paryantang means um, encircled by or bounded, bounded by uh, purang full nanapakarasa of various kinds um, asuchino of unclean things um, so one pays attention to this body um, up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head uh, and encircled by skin as being filled with all kinds of unclean things. Ati imas min kaye, in this body there are um, kesa, head hairs, loma, body hairs, naka, nails, danta, teeth, tacho, skin, mangsang, muscles, naharu, sinews, ati, bones, ati minjang, bone marrow, Vakang, let's see, kidney, hariyang, heart, yakanang, lungs, I think? No, liver. See, liver. Yay, we get to pay attention to our liver. Um, Kalomakang, plura. What the hell is plura? Oops. <laughs> uh, plura. Membranes, I think I've seen that translated. Membranes? Lungs, I think. No, no. Uh, what's that? The right lung, interesting. Okay. Let's see. Piha kung spleen. <laughs> spleen. Pa no, papasa is lung. No, I think kaloma kung is membranes, um, as I remember. This automatic dictionary is sometimes has less perfect translations. Um, Lungs, uh, untang, uh, bowels, antagunang, intestines, adarayang, stomach, karisang, excrement. Um, did you know that there's excrement inside your body right now? Yeah, we're full of shit. <laughs> 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 Is that in the <laughs> Yep, it's right here. Um, uh, let's see, pitang, bile, um, semhang, phlegm, fubo, pus, lohitang, blood, sado, sweat, mado, fat, asu. Oh, this is not the right translation. Oh, it's not listed here. Um, asu, I think, is tears. Is that right? Yeah, vasa, fat, kalo, saliva. Um, singanika, mucus, uh, lasika, uh, fluid of the joints, like joint fluid. Um, so going through the body um, in terms of its, its different parts, its anatomical parts. And I have to admit, this is one practice that I never connected with. Um, but there's one monk I know who was a uh, registered nurse before he became a monk. And he found this practice very easy for him because he'd been through med school, so he already had a very clear understanding of all the different um, organs and fluids and different bits and pieces inside the body. So it's quite easy for him to go through his body and feel these different parts of it. So with this practice, what people will commonly do is they'll start with a, a picture um, of each part to kind of remind you of what it is and maybe like a an anatomical drawing so you can see where it is in your body. And then you try to feel it inside your body. 
So this is not a visualization exercise. So you're not visualizing your lungs. You're trying to actually feel them inside your body. You're not visualizing your heart. You're trying to actually feel it inside your body. And I mentioned those two because those are two of the easiest ones because they're producing very strong sensations all the time. So every time you breathe in and out, you feel your lungs very powerfully. We just mostly don't pay any attention, but the sensation is there and it's very strong. Similarly, your heart is constantly beating, which produces a very strong sensation that if you turn your attention to it, you can feel it. So you can actually try like putting your hand over your heart and you can feel the heartbeat. And then even with your hand away, you can still feel the heart beating inside your chest. So it's starting to bring mindfulness inside the body, not just on the outside. So it starts on the outside. Um, so it starts with hair, nails, teeth, and skin. So that's all outside. But then it goes to feeling the inside, feeling your muscles. Uh, it's like as you, as you move your body, you can feel your muscles moving inside your skin. Um, liquids. Uh, so one that I find really interesting here is blood. Uh, you can feel the blood rushing through your veins. You can feel it flowing like rivers through your body, all throughout the body. It's right here. It actually does feel like little rivers of water flowing through your body. And you can be clearly, directly aware of the sensation of blood flowing through your body. It's fascinating. Um, since it's allergy season, you might also be clearly aware of mucus. Um, I was clearly aware of it during meditation last night um, when my nose was running. Uh, so yeah, cultivating this clear awareness of the inside of your body uh, in this way can be very potent for many people. Um, so this meditation practice, I should also say, is um, often used for people who have very strong lust people who have problems with very strong sexual desire. Because when you're relating to the body as being made up of like blood and intestines and kidneys and things, then you're usually less interested in various activities that you might do with bodies. Um, but not for everyone. For some people, it has the opposite effect. Uh, <laughs> but in, in monastic circles, this meditation is commonly used as a remedy for sexual desire. Um, but even if that's not what you're trying to do, um, it's still a, a very powerful way of developing a clear awareness of the inside of your body. Um, then the Buddha gives a, a simile here. Uh, so he says, monks, just as there's a bag with an opening on both ends, which <laughs> is full of uh, various kinds of grains, um, and he gives a list, for example, rice and beans and lentils and millet. And, uh, and then a person with eyes would dump it out and look through it, saying like, oh, this is white rice, this is brown rice, this is beans, this is lentils, this is sesame seeds, and so on. In the same way, uh, a monk pays attention to this body, um, up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head, um, wrapped in skin as being full of all kinds of uh, unclean things. Um, and he goes through the, the list again. Um, and topping up with the same contemplation. Uh, so thus one pays attention to the body internally and externally. One pays attention to the uh, characteristic of arising and vanishing uh, in the body. Um, and one uh, is not attached to anything and doesn't cling to anything in the world. So any questions or comments on this one? Yes. I do. Is, is the, when he's referring to unclean, is that completely literal? Or is it just about, you know, going back to excrement? Or is that figurative at all, as in the unclean? You know, I mean, is he referring to your body parts as being unclean? Yeah, and I think he just means that in a very literal sense that, like, a big bloody chunk of meat is not clean. It's a big bloody chunk of meat. Got it. But that's what this is. It's a big bloody chunk of meat. Yeah. Um, so we usually relate to our body as being this, this like beautiful thing that we dress up nicely and we comb the hair and we put on makeup and it looks all special and, and splendid. Right. Um, but actually it's a big bag full of like blood and guts and bones and things. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I just, I just didn't know if he was talking about the unclean as they speak in metal lies, and it's unclean as in it's, you know, more of a, a mental, you know, the uncleanliness of, of what you're trying to get out by meditating, mm. or, or it was just literally the uncleanliness uncle- of that exact decaying. Mm. Yeah, so I take it as, as being very literal here. Okay. Um, so there's a tendency to be very delusional about our bodies. Mm. Um, because we like to think of our bodies as being beautiful and pleasant. Yeah, no, um, at least I do. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all apart. I'm, I'm pretty weird. <laughs> uh, so the, the Buddha, he's not trying to make us disgusted with our bodies, right. but rather he's trying to encourage us to actually have a clear understanding of what's actually here. Uh, so clearly aware that there is, in fact, a bag of blood and bones and excrement and all that, right here in this chair. Um, And that doesn't need to disgust you. In fact, it shouldn't, because disgust is aversion. Disgust arises in a defiled mind. A Buddha is fully aware of blood and guts and all that, but is not disgusted by it. But he's also not infatuated with the hair and the skin and all that either. He knows that it's just hair and skin and blood and bones. Um, none of it is either beautiful or revolting. It's all just the body. And the body just is what it is, which is arising and vanishing. Um, yep. Yeah, so it's, it's not cultivating disgust. This is a very important point because often people think that this practice is about making you disgusted with your body. That's not the practice. The practice is about cultivating a very calm, cool, peaceful understanding of the body on its own terms, of the body as it is. So there's nothing inherently gross about the body, and there's nothing inherently beautiful about the body. It's just a body. Okay. Anything else on this one? Uh, so the Buddha spoke in terms that people would understand at the time. So since germ theory wasn't in general awareness, um, he didn't speak in those terms as far as I'm aware. Uh, so the Buddha would have known about the existence of pathogens, but he wouldn't speak about it because nobody would have any clue what he was talking about. Um, so. Yeah, he might have had that in mind when he said this, but I don't think he would have said it explicitly or directly. Okay, um, next section. Uh, first, are we done with that one? Everyone clear on that? Body parts? Are we all going to quietly pretend we never heard that section? <laughs> this is what usually happens when people read the Satipatthana Sutta, is they just quietly pretend that certain parts of it don't exist. Just like with our bodies, actually. We just quietly pretend that certain parts of it don't exist. And here's another one, monks. Uh, A monk pays attention to this body uh, in whatever way it uh, is disposed as being composed of elements or components. Ati imas minkaye, patavidatu, apodatu, tejodatu, vayodatu. In this body, there is the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. So, this is not meant to be taken literally. Uh, so, these days when we talk about elements, people talk about hydrogen and helium and oxygen and so on. Um, but rather, it's aspects of experience. Uh, so, the earth element is the experience of solid, heavy, dense, weighty matter within the body. The water element is the experience of fluid, liquid, cohesive aspects of the body. The fire element is the experience of heat and coolness within the body. And the air element is the experience of uh, expansion and contraction uh, and movement within the body. So uh, this uh, 
is the four elements, and the Buddha also in a number of other places gives two more. Um, the two others are space and consciousness. Those are not included here because they're not directly related to the body. Uh, so here he's just giving the first four because the first four are all uh, related to the body. And these four kinds of body experience together make up everything that we think of as the body. So every single bodily experience we have is an experience either of solidity, fluidity, heat, or movement. So these four elements of experience. Um, so there's meditation methods of focusing on one or more of these elements, trying to feel it clearly within your own body. Uh, and um, then there's a number of contemplations that you can do from there. So here the Buddha, again, is emphasizing the same perception of impermanence. So clearly seeing, for example, the earth element in the body. So the experience of solidity as something which is constantly appearing and vanishing. Or the experience of heat as something that's constantly changing, constantly arising and ceasing. Um, the practice on the elements that I normally give instructions on is uh, a bit different. The instruction I normally give is taken from other suttas, where the Buddha talks about being aware of each of the elements within your body, then being aware of it in the outside world, and being aware that it's exactly the same element. So for example, the air element. As you're breathing, there's air inside your body. There's also air outside your body, but it's exactly the same air. There's no boundary or distinction or separation between it. It's all just air. So the air that's outside is clearly not me and not mine. And the air inside is therefore also clearly not me and not mine. It's all just air. None of it is me and none of it is mine. So doing that contemplation with each of the six elements is a way of clearly seeing that what we normally think of as me and mine is actually not me and not mine. Uh, so this is the way I normally talk about the meditation on the elements. So using it as a way of practicing the perception of not self. Um, but here the Buddha is using it, uh, again, just the first four elements, just the physical elements. Um, and as a starting point to the practice of impermanence, perceiving, arising, and vanishing. Um, and he gives a rather strange simile here. Um, he says, monks, just as a skilled butcher um, or apprentice butcher who has killed a cow at a crossroads um, might divide it up into bits, uh, different pieces. Um, in the same way, uh, a monk perceives this body is composed of elements. Um, in this body, there is the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element. Um, so I wouldn't get too caught up on this. So cutting up a cow actually makes me think a lot more of the previous simile. But I think his point here is just about dividing our experience um, up into discrete segments. So like this is the experience of solidity, the experience of solid matter. This is the experience of liquid, of moisture. This is the experience of heat. So normally we just relate to the body as this single relatively solid, wet, warm thing with air in it. Um, but here the Buddha is saying, well, be more precise. Pay attention to each of these characteristics separately so that we really understand them fully. Uh, so one of the overall themes that we see running through all of these practices is developing precision of knowing. So not this kind of just general vague knowing, uh, but precision of knowing, a precise, clear, detailed knowing of our bodily experience. Um, any questions on this one? Any questions at all? Okay. All right, now we're getting into more fun stuff, which, again, people like to quietly pretend isn't in the sutta. Um, so next is the nine cemetery contemplations. Does that fill anybody with joy? <laughs> Just me? Okay. Uh, anybody else joy? Okay, I see a, a few hands. Oh, this is so great. I love Buddhists. Um, 
So one of the practices that we do in Buddhism is contemplation of death. Uh, but here, um, it's not necessarily contemplation of death, but rather it's contemplation of the nature of the body. Um, so I'm going to go through each of these contemplations relatively quickly and then talk about them all together. Uh, so Punachaprang Bhikkave Bhikkhu, so um, here's another one. Uh, a monk might regard a body uh, discarded in a cemetery. And in the Buddhist time, cemeteries were not like they are in this country where there's these like pretty parks with trees and stone sculptures and flowers and everything looks very like neat and tidy and orderly. Um, at the time of the Buddha, when somebody died, you would take the body and just throw it on the ground outside the village. So at any time you could go to the edge of the village and you could see human bodies in various stages of decomposition. Um, so this was a practice that people would do uh, in order to come to a deeper understanding of their own body is they would go out and they would look at dead bodies in various stages of decomposition and reflect. This body is like that body. This body is becoming like that body. So that's the practice he's, re he's recommending here. So uh, one might go and look at uh, a body discarded in a cemetery one or two or three days dead. Uh, let's see, what's this word? Swollen, um, discolored, uh, producing maggots. Um, and one would compare it to this body. Um, this body also has the same characteristic. It is becoming like that. It is not exempt from that. Um, so it's, uh, again, it's not just looking at dead bodies, just as some like creepy obsession, uh, but rather to reflect. This body is of the same nature as that one. This body is becoming like that one. This body will be like that one. Um, and this is a very important practice because many of us have this, again, kind of persistent delusion that our body's not going to die. Um, even though on an intellectual level, we know that it's going to die. We still relate to our body as being uh, reliable because it's been pretty reliable so far. Every day we wake up and it's still alive and it still moves around more or less. Some days not so well, but for the most part still functioning. So we tend to have this persistent background belief that that's going to continue forever. So this practice is reminding ourselves, no, the body is eventually going to run out of energy and it's going to die and it's going to start decomposing. So that's the first contemplation, um, is more on the level of just awareness of death, awareness that this body will eventually die. Then things start to get more interesting. Uh, so then one um, sees a body in the cemetery that's being chewed on by crows, being chewed on by dogs and vultures and jackals and um, various kinds of worms, um, DP, panthers, oh that's fun, <laughs> <laughs> panthers, uh, cigala, jackals, yep, jackals, uh, and, and one compares it to the same body, this body is of the same nature, it's becoming like that, it's not exempt from that, um, so this body too might become food for the crows, and the wild dogs and the worms and all that. Um, one sees a body discarded in the cemetery, uh, a collection of bones with flesh and blood connected by sinews, uh, collection of bones uh, without muscles, um, but still bloody and bound with sinews, a collection of bones with no flesh and blood bound with sinews, um, scattered bones, uh, dispersed in various directions. So here a hand bone, there a foot bone, there a thigh bone, I think the ankle bone, Ooh, fun. Um, there a thigh bone, there a chest bone, there a kata? Hmm. hip bone. Hmm. Um, I don't think this is pleasant, let's see. Rib bone, okay, there a rib bone, there a back bone, there a torso bone, chest bone, I guess. Um, there are a, a throat bone, um, blah, 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 on and on, tooth bone, 
skull. Uh, and one regards this, same, this body as being the same way. So this body is becoming like that. It's not exempt from that. So this is going through the stages of decomposition. So as the body gradually, all the flesh and blood um, decomposes and wears away until there's just scattered bones. Um, then he goes into uh, seeing a body which, um, again, scattered bones which have turned white, um, bones which are several years old, bones which are crumbling to dust. So this is where I find it getting really interesting, is also recollecting that this body, um, after it dies, it will gradually decompose um, and eventually it will return to dust and the dust will mix back with the soil. Elsewhere in the suttas, the Buddha says more explicitly, like when this body dies, the earth-like parts will return to the earth, the watery parts will return to the water, the heat will return to the heat, and the air will return to the air. In other words, this body is just made up of natural components, and when it dies, it will, those components will just return to what they came from. Um, so the body will crumble into dust and mix back with the dust in the soil. The, uh, the water will evaporate into the clouds or seep into the groundwater. Um, the heat will dissipate into the environment. Um, the air will go back to the air. Uh, but that's what this body is made up in the first place of. This body is made up of the earth, water, heat, and air that used to be in the outside world. So, um, and actually, as you pay close attention to your body, you can see that that exchange is already happening. You're already taking on earth, water, heat, and air from the outside world in every moment and shedding earth, water, heat, and air in every moment. So that exchange is already happening, uh, but the contemplation of the decomposition of the body makes it much more real. Um, because also, uh, this is pointing to the fact that eventually there won't be anything left of this body at all. There won't be anything to be found. But the components that used to make up this body will have gone, in, gone on into other things. There'll be, uh, other things will be, made, will be made up of them. Um, so I remember a while back, somebody had done the math and calculated that each person's body contains a few molecules from the body of the Buddha, <laughs> which I find fascinating. Um, this also applies for every other famous person throughout history. Uh, yeah, that too. Um, but it's also kind of beside the point. It's just dirt, water, heat, and air. It doesn't belong to anybody in particular. Uh, and this can be a fun meditation practice, by the way. So as you're sitting, uh, feeling your body and visualizing your body dying and then decomposing. So uh, first the the flesh and blood, the, the flesh decomposes and vanishes, the blood evaporates, uh, the bones crumble into dust, uh, and the dust mixes back into the soil. So as you're sitting here, you can visualize your body dying, decomposing, crumbling to dust, and the dust mixing back with the soil till there's nothing here, nothing here at all. Um, and he gives the same contemplation exercise. One dwells perceiving the body internally, externally, both internally and externally. Samudaya dhammanu pasiva kaya smingraharati, vaya dhammanu pasiva kaya smingraharati, samudaya vaya dhammanu pasiva kaya smingraharati. One perceives the nature of appearing and vanishing uh, in the body. Atikayo tiva panasa sati pachu patita hoti yave deva nyana mataya patis sati mataya. Or one is aware uh, of the existence of the body to the degree necessary for knowledge and uh, awareness. Anisi toja vaharati nati kinti loke upadiyati. And one dwells uh, independent, not clinging to anything in the world. Evampiko bhikave bhikkhu kaye kayana pasi vaharati. In this way also a monk dwells perceiving the body as the body. Um, so that's it for the section on mindfulness of the body. Um, any questions? We have five minutes left. So any questions about anything we've covered today? I know it's been a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Just ask, um, until the 
the next session, what should we be meditating on if we want to really, like, I mean, there's so much there. Like, mm -hmm. what would you recommend? Pick something that interests you and play with it. That's what I recommend. Yeah. Go ahead. So I just, what you just said about the turn, basically turning into dust and becoming a part of everything, um, I just remembered seeing a documentary, I guess, on uh, this thing where peop a lot of people think that the Buddha was buried in a certain place or laid in a certain place. And people go there, there's shrines all around, and they you know, visit and try to become a part of that. And uh, it just seems like they're kind of missing the whole point. Like, these people are supposed to be Buddhists, but they're like looking for something permanent, basically, or some <coughs> solid, you know. Um, I think, uh, I mean, just speaking for myself, um, it's more about getting a feeling of connection to the Buddha. So like going to the places where the Buddha lived, to the places where he taught, to the places where he walked, well, the places where he passed away. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's more a matter of what helps a person get a sense of connection to the Buddha. So I don't say anything wrong with that personally. I mean, I'm not um, condemning them. I'm just saying that I feel like it yeah. kind of misses the whole point of us becoming just inert matter and not maybe being a thing, you know. Um, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, and there is a sutta, uh, we actually just read it in sutta class the other day, um, where the Buddha says, one who sees me sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees me. Um, in other words, through directly understanding the Dhamma, um, that's like being in the presence of the Buddha. Right, um, but there is also something about uh, doing activities which gives you a feeling of closeness to the Buddha. Um, so many people, they find that going to the pilgrimage sites in India, they find it a very powerfully moving experience um, that, that strengthens their, their faith in the Buddhist path. So while I haven't done that, um, hopefully someday I will. I think it's worth doing. So what would it mean mm. if you went to that spot and it gave you that powerful feeling and then uh, five years later you found out that he was actually buried on the other side of India or something? Like it doesn't there. matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> it's just yeah. the journey. It doesn't matter, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come. I don't think it's about misunderstanding the teaching when we know in the teaching that he was not buried, he was cremated, mm -hmm. his body was divided into eight parts and where does it go? Uh, I think the pilgrimage and the, the renovations to to Buddha history or the path or whatever, it's part of the process of the learning of deepening Dharma, but it's not about blindly taking that as Dhamma. I, I don't think we we we, may, we we bow to a stupa means that I don't understand Dhamma. It's part of mm. learning Dhamma. I think it's a gesture. It's a, it's a, mm. it's a process. It's a, it's a way of respecting, but I don't think it's, it's done without wisdom. Of course, mm. some people done it so superstitiously and without wisdom, without understanding Dhamma. But I don't think it's, it is for, for misunderstanding mm -hmm. Dhamma. We, we know yeah. that we will die. That the Buddha died. It's not, not, but it's about respecting that fact or learning the history of this person who was dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And also, it's, I think it's worth pointing out that in the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha said that after, he says after his passing away, there are four places mm -hmm. that people will go mm -hmm. uh, to remember him. So the place where he was born, um, the place where he attained awakening, the place where he first taught, and the place where he passed away. So those are the four traditional pilgrimage sites because that's what the Buddha said. He said, after I pass away, these are the four places that you can go to to remember me by. Um, so it's, uh, again, there's, there's scriptural basis for the pilgrimage sites. Um, so I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, if it helps your practice, then that's a good thing. Uh, and we also, we need to be careful not to get too dry and cold in our Buddhist practice. 
Um, so keeping that, that warmth, like that warm-hearted spirit of devotion alive in any way uh, is very valuable. It's very potent. Um, so it's worth doing. Uh, oh, yeah. So I just try it out. I, I, I take experiment um, myself, and I went to the temple, and I do feel really like absurd. And that's how, like, that's just my, from my perspective. Like, if I suspect it, I like, try it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all well, of you or need to organize a pilgrimage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Do you, like to <laughs> <laughs> do you want to help? Do you want to help organize it? Okay, great. Ooh, oh, so maybe we'll wait another year or so then. Um, so it's, it's after 7, so I think we should go ahead and formally end the class. And if anybody wants to stay and chat a little bit more, we can do it then.